I hope you can see the image on the screen. Is it up there yet? Not quite. It's going to be in just a moment. I don't know if you're a Calvin and Hobbes fan, but Calvin uh, and Hobbes is something that I enjoy uh, looking at every now and then. So as soon as I saw this one, I thought the perfect beginning for my sermon. Uh, Calvin says, Dad, where do babies come from? Don't you like that question as parents? Where do babies come from? Is it true the stork leaves them swaddled in a bundle on the front step? Dad, of course, he's going to be thinking about that. And he says, well, in most cases, yes, but you were unceremoniously dropped down the chimney by a big, hairy pterodactyl. Of course, Calvin, you know, it's like, that's a great thing. So he says, cool, cool. And then Dad makes this remark, explains a lot, doesn't it? Explains a lot. Now, I don't know if you uh, have read much of Calvin and Hobbes, but this particular strip here just was a perfect beginning because I'm talking about beginnings today getting started with, with God and this kind of thing. Uh, beginnings say a lot about us. I was tempted to talk about our nation's new beginning with the elections. I'm not going there. I really want to talk about personal beginnings today. Um, and so when I talk about beginnings, it, it draws us to the whole subject, of course, children. Children. They're pretty important to God, right? They're pretty important to Jesus. Jesus said something about that. And so I want us to consider a child's early development. Uh, a child that has just, just, just had three months, or just the three months, the first three months of, of, of a child's life, uh, that child develops in crazy ways. Uh, this is from WebMD. Uh, just, just some things, just some things, and there's more, but just some things during the first three months. The child smiles. I remember when my kids were born, I wanted to, as soon as possible, I was looking for that smile right? And of course, maybe I read smiles that really weren't smiles. Maybe they were just burps or something or you know what else or whatever, right? But smiles, right? The child learns to smile, raises her head and chest on her tummy. That's a big deal. Tracks objects with her eyes and gradually, de uh, gradually decrease eye crossing. Here's another one. Open and shut her hands and brings her hands to her mouth. You know, we, 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 those of us who are parents, we've witnessed these things. Uh, then this one, gripping objects with her hands, right? Starts doing that, getting these motor functions, these kinds of things. And then uh, this, 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 this last one here that's listed by WebMD is takes swipes at or reach, reaches for dangling objects, though she usually won't be able to get them yet. The point is the child is going through tremendous changes in the first three months. Uh, I want you to think about those things for a moment, but, but that only leads us to think about something else because it's in the first year that a child begins to talk. Now, not every child begins to talk during the first three years or the first year. Uh, sometimes children take much longer, but, but it's very common for children to start picking up words, start learning to talk during the first year and so forth. Um, and, and do you know where language comes from for a child? This is going to be so obvious it's so obvious, it's ridiculous I'm saying this, but I'm doing it anyway. In fact, some of this, this message is going to be in some ways so obvious that, wow, I mean, it's like, why am I even saying it? But it's good to reflect on these things and think about this. Do you know where language comes from? It comes from hearing, right? It comes from hearing. Uh, this month, I'm focusing on hearing God, hearing God. Uh, and, and it's no accident that the Lord has told us that we are his children. It's no accident, you see? 1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. Sometimes we kind of just brush over those kinds of statements. Like, yeah, I know, I know, but, you know, tell me something I don't know. But no, 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 just we need to stop and reflect on these things sometimes. See what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God. I want you to think about that a little bit as we consider a baby's language development. A baby's language, and even her or his way of thinking, because language actually structures thinking, it comes from hearing, from listening to things that go on in the world, and particularly from parents, as parents talk to their children. Now, as for moms and dads, we love it when our child really pinpoints one of us. So, for example, all right, if, if uh, Christy and I, you know, we, we've had three children by birth, 
And it was just great to hear my children all say, dad, 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 long before they ever said, ma, 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 ma. Now, she was here, she would kind of roll her eyes. But, but, you know, there's this kind of competition, right, for parents. We want the child to just say, and you know, as a dad, I want that first word to be dada, which, well, really it wasn't. But nevertheless, um, uh, there's this little competition. Now, the reason for that is because there is a desire in parents, yes, this connects to God, there is a desire in parents to connect with their children. Super important. It's a super big deal. Uh, there's something missing when your child doesn't connect to you. Um, it's, it's no different with God, is it? It's no different with God and his children. God wants to connect to you and to me. See what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of of God. It's so basic, but so important, you see, this connection. Now, Daniel Siegel, and I'm going to go through some material here with Daniel Siegel, and I just want you to stay with me. I want you to be patient, because uh, I've wrestled with this really all week, with how much of this material do I give the church? I don't want to lose them. I don't want them to be bored or anything, and so I, won't spend, I try not to spend too much time on this. But Daniel Siegel has, is, gives a uh, description about the importance, or he talks about the importance of parents connecting with their children the right way. So this is what he, what he says in the middle of his book. This, in fact, I brought the book up here, and I might actually read a little bit out of it, which is against the whole letter of preaching, but nevertheless, uh, Parenting from the Inside Out by Daniel Siegel, MD. So, so but this, look, look, look what he says here. Uh, put it up on the screen. I hope you can read that. It's a little small, but look, look, look at what he says. He says, learning to communicate and listen empathically. Now, empathically means em- with empathy. Right? So you have empathy, so you kind of understand another's feelings. So learning to listen empathically is a vital part of parenting. At the heart of this openness is parental presence, the receptive state in which we take in the signals from others and have compassion and kindness in our interactions. Caring communication supports the development of a healthy attachment. Parents, you want to be attached to your children? You need to have healthy or, you know, you have to, have to, have, have to be uh, present to them. Caring communication supports the development of a healthy attachment that is especially important in building a trusting parent-child relationship. And then I highlighted this. Studies performed across many cultures suggest that a common element in healthy attachment is the ability of a parent and child to have a reciprocal give-and-take signals, to have, have these, these signals. In, you know, in other words, it's not just the child speaking, and it's not just mom and dad speaking. It's actually both of them hearing, both of them hearing, both of them listening, okay? Siegel calls this contingent communication. So I'll I'll continue to read reading on the next slide, on the next slide. Yeah. This is called contingent communication. Now, what's contingency? Something that is contingent is something that occurs or exists uh, only if certain circumstances come to fruition or if if they happen. Right? So, so c- contingent communication. Uh, this is called commu- contingent communication. It means that the signals sent by the child, the child's always sending signals, are directly perceived, understood, and responded to by the parent in a dance of communication. I love that phrase. In a dance of communication that involves mutual collaboration. So now the child and the parent are on the t- same team. All right? Communicating, connecting, Thinking, learning to think in similar ways, similar patterns. Parents feel good and their children feel good too when, when interactions are respectful and responsive to each individual. This contingent communication enables a vitalizing sense of connection that may be a, at the heart of nurturing relationships across the lifespan. In other words, parents, the way that you communicate and the way that you listen to your children in the very early days and in the first times that you have them, for those of us who have taken on foster children, for example, are so critical. It it can affect an entire lifetime. And think about that for a moment. When you affect a child in this way for a lifetime, guess what happens when that child ends up growing up and has his or her own children? It passes on. passes on. Um, 
there's no way to overestimate the value of these early days in parent and childhood. Now, yes, this all connects to God in the way that we connect to God. We'll get to that a little bit more. I got I to gotta go on with, with Siegel, though, because Siegel is, uh, when you start reading this and thinking about this in reference to what God wants in our lives, it just, like, it just opens things up. The way that God wants to deal with us, the way he wants to work with us, the way he wants to love us. Okay, so I'm going to go on with, with, uh, with him right here, with Siegel here. Contingent communication allows us to expand our own minds by taking another's point, points of view and seeing our point of view reflected in, in their responses. From the beginning of life, the infant requires collaborative communication in order to thrive. In other words, a child has to, be in, has to be, have this ongoing connection and moving in similar directions as the parent. When a baby smiles and makes soft, wordless sounds, a nurturing parent responds in like manner by smiling back at the baby. No, it's not a silly thing to smile back at your baby. It's not silly at all. And imitating some of the sounds, so this whole goo-goo, gaga stuff, it may seem silly, but it's important, right? A lot of men need to know this. A lot of men think, ah, I'm a man, I don't need to <laughs> treat my child that way. No, 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 no. Go with the goo goo gaga stuff, right? Do it, right? goes on. A dialogue is begun which says to the baby, I see you, and I'm listening to you, and I'll give back to you a reflection of yourself that is valued so that you can see and value yourself too. I like you just the way you are. Thus, a connection is made through the simple dialogue of give and take of signals that creates a sense of joining our child's emotion, uh, well-being, is built on the intimate, on this intimate dance of communication. So think about that. The emotional health of a child is determined by, are you present? Uh, Siegel goes on um, in like the next page in his book, and he talks about a, a woman who comes home from work. She comes home from work, and she's, I mean, she's tired. She's worked all day, and you know, she has her work clothes on, and she comes home, and what does she want to do? She wants to, you know, change and get into comfortable clothes. But the moment she walks in the door, her 22-month-old son comes running up to her, and, you know, this kind of thing. And what does she do? What's, what's her response? She says, well, she says, um, I'll get to you in a minute after I change my clothes. You think a 22-month-old cares about the change of clothes? 22-month-old just wants to be received then. Receive me now. And so mom says, that's not appropriate. You know, I, don't, I'm, I need, to get, need to change my clothes. And he starts fighting and kicking things. What does mom do? I'm not, gonna, I'm not, I'm not going to, uh, you know, um, approve of that behavior. And so the mom starts to disconnect from the child because the child is misbehaving, which leads to more misbehaving, which leads to more disconnection. And no matter, you know, it just doesn't work, Right. And so by the time that mom has finally you know, got her clothes changed and she's more comfortable and so forth, she's so disconnected from the child that it ruins the entire evening and they're not able to really you know, join, which is what the child really needs. And that, guess what? It's what the parent needs. So, so this stuff becomes really important. Now, the way that this connects, of course, is what John says in his first letter, chapter 3, verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. Um, now, like I said, this month, been talking about hearing God. This is one of these messages that tells us why we are listening, trying to hear God. I'm not really giving you the how-to here as much as I'm just trying to say, look, this is so crucial. It's so easily missed in our lives with God. Uh, dancing with God, or the dance, uh, the dance, which is really a dance of not only communication, but a dance of love, um, is what hearing God is all about. Hearing God is about things like guidance, no doubt. We want to know, you know, should we do this thing or do this other thing? What choice should I make? Uh, I preached a sermon uh, about a, two months ago on hearing, uh, entitled Hearing God as Intended, and I said in that sermon that we can only hear God as well as we can understand him. That's it, right? Therefore, we must know the story. We must, you know, try to understand who God is 
study his nature and his character and this kind of thing. All right? Um, last week's sermon, I said that hearing God comes by the speaking of words and also by the doing of the divine will. And I'm not going to go into those things in detail, okay, because that's what last sermon was about. But the point is this, is that hearing God really can be about quite a few things. But the most important thing that, it, that happens in hearing God is entering into the dance of love. It really is. That God, guess what? He wants to hear from us. And he's not like the mom who's busy. He's attentive at every moment. That's the gift that we have is God as father, God as parent, God like a mother, is that he's always there, always listening. He's not distracted, right? And we are his children, you see? And, you know, when we enter into this dance of love, we discover our value. I'm all about growing up. I want to grow up in Jesus. I want to be mature. I want to know the scriptures. I want to know the original languages. I want to be able to take those scriptures apart. I want to speak about all kinds of theological truth. I want to be able to, you know, uh, be apologetic. You know, what I mean by that is arguing for the faith. I want to do all those things. But you know what? What really matters is that I'm in the dance of love with God. What I really want more than anything else is to know from hearing God that I'm loved in the deepest places, that I'm received. And you know what? I suspect that that's true for you too. This is why the New Testament tells us that when we come to God, when we come to Jesus Christ, we can be born again. Do you think that somehow we outgrow hearing those words from God that we are valued, that we are loved, that he gives us mercy and grace? We never outgrow those things. We're going to spend eternity hearing from God. He's going to say, I love you. I'm with you. He's going to show us his hands, and we're going to follow his feet. <laughs> Because we know we're loved. And somehow in the mystery of this, we're accepted by him. Many of you know the story in John 3, but there may be few that don't, and either way, it's a good reminder. John 3, the first three verses read like this. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews. In other words, he was a very powerful person. Pharisees were a powerful group in Judaism, and he was a very important one among them. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one could do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Look at what Jesus tells him right away. He looks right through the stuff. He goes to the, real, the meat of the matter. Jesus said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Notice what he's saying. He's saying that there's a whole world of darkness. Right? I told uh, uh, someone, or maybe a couple people today, that, that the people who really like the light in the church are going to sit like toward the middle because of those skylights and the others are going to apparently like the darkness. But Jesus isn't talking about that kind of light. He's talking about a different kind of light. And he talks a lot about light in John's Gospel. And notice it's about seeing here. He says, he, says, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You know what I think Jesus could have just as well said? I think Jesus could have just as well said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot hear the kingdom of God. Because he's speaking. And he wants us to listen to him. He wants us to hear him. I wonder, can you hear God's voice in your life? If you say, you know, pastor, I don't even know what God's voice is like. 
I don't even know what you mean by that. Am I supposed to listen to an audible voice? Am I supposed to hear some sort of strange sound? What am I supposed to hear? You'll know it when you hear it. You will. And I'm going to talk more about, precisely about what his voice is like. But in this message, I just want you to realize that you're a child. You know, I've got to tell you, you're always going to be one with God. And in order for you to be valued, not just one time back there, oh, I came to Christ, I know he loved me, he valued me. No, in order for, it's more than that. In order for you to continue to know your worth and your value, it's imperative that you learn the language. Talk about children learning language. Learn the language of God in your own heart and mind. Because he wants you to hear. You know, Paul said, and I challenged with this last week, Paul said this to give you some encouragement that we can hear his voice. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he talks about two different kinds of people. He talks about the natural person and the spiritual person. And he says this, he says, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. In other words, he can't hear them. For they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things. Why is that? Because the spiritual person hears from God. The spiritual person hears all things, or judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord as so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ which means we can hear his voice. Some of us have very childlike minds of Christ, and maybe that's okay while we're in this life. There is a place for maturity, but we, may we never forget that we are children and even young children before God our Father. Um, I want you to understand that today that the Lord is speaking in the bread and in the cup. There's a voice here. God speaks in many different ways. One of the ways that he speaks is he gives us a, what we say in the church, a tangible word. Uh, God gives us this cup. He gives us this bread because some of us are very dull. Probably all, in some sense, are pretty dull at hearing. We need to hear him today. And there's so much more I could say about this material in John 3, but what I want to do is stay out of Jesus' way today. I want him to speak to you. You don't need to really hear from me anymore. You need to hear from him. And so as we enter into Holy Communion, my only request is that you come to the Lord and say, Jesus... Father, speak to me. Let me hear you. I don't know how to hear you, but let me hear you. If you've never been born again, if you've never come into an experience of, of being able to start hearing his voice, then you can, you can have this time with Jesus. If you simply say, Lord Jesus, would you forgive me of my sin and come to me and give me new ears? He will do it. He will do it. And then just come talk to me sometime later or after the service. Okay? Let's pray before we enter into Holy Communion. Father, we thank you that you want to connect with us. That you don't want to be a disconnected parent. But that you're